and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on podcastufo.com. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and this is Podcast UFO, and we're coming at you live. And I have the one and only Alejandro Rojas back from Roswell coming up in just a minute. Our guest this evening is Jeremy Medor, and he is going to be talking about UFO crashes and events in Nevada and in Utah, northern Utah. So uh, it should be an interesting show. And uh, if you uh, are supporting the show, I want to thank you. And if you can't support the show, we still love you anyway. You can always listen to the full show live uh, right here on Podcast UFO. Dot com every Wednesday evening at 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's also on PSN Radio as well at the same time. And it's as a podcast, the full show, on the Dark Matter Digital Network every Thursday from 10 to midnight. And so there we go. We're ready to talk to Alejandro. How was Roswell? It was out of this world. <laughs> So that's the first time I've used it like that because, of course, it's annoying. The news uses it all the time. In fact, it was kind of funny. And he was a nice guy, but there was this one reporter who uh, a few years ago was talking about our conference. And he's like, oh, I've already got, you know, what I'm going to say worked out. And I'm going to say, um, you know, this event is out of this world. <laughs> and he looks at us to be like, oh, wow, that's great. And it was <laughs> It wah, was really wah. awkward, yeah, because we're just wah, like, wah. yeah. In fact, we were a little disappointed. It's like, don't you realize we hear this all the time? <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. Anyway, um, you took me by surprise on that one. Yeah, so. but Roswell was great. Um, a lot of fun. In fact, um, you know, there was the there were the speakers at the museum. And then there was our group, uh, and we were speaking for the newspaper, and we did meet. In fact, they invited us over for breakfast. I usually speak at the museum, but um, this was a really unique group at the paper that I was really excited to be with. Um, so the other speakers were Lee Spiegel, who's, of course, a good friend, um, but also... Colonel John Alexander, I mean, he was in the Army and intelligence. Uh, he worked at Los Alamos and, uh, you know, with uh, other friends in intelligence, looked into the UFOs and, and other paranormal phenomena. And then, of course, there's Colonel Charles Halt, who was a witness, highest ranking military UFO witness is part of one of the most incredible cases ever. And then Nick Pope, who uh, worked for the Ministry of Defense investigating UFOs. So the level of, you can't really beat that level of credibility. Um, Keith Aram, who was the guy who made the Phoenix Incident movie, was also there. Um, and so that was fun. And uh, so he had a showing of his movie and, and we did a panel and, and stuff like that. I actually emceed the event and... Um, we had i felt some really great conversations it was it was uh, really fun yeah now it's funny i i as you know i uh i am an antique person appraiser or whatever mm -hmm. i had my phone rang yesterday and i looked at the i saw the person's name and it said roswell new mexico <laughs> so he answered it had nothing to do with uh ufos and roswell so i did in the conversation, he actually is having me look at uh, some Asian arts. Uh, so in the conversation, I said to him, so Roswell, huh? Uh, what do you think about that crash, you know, and all this stuff? And he goes, yeah, well, you know, he, he was just into He said, yeah, we just had this big event here. And he said they rent out more hotels than anyone else in the whole state in any other event. Now, is that true? How many people come to this event? I doubt that's true. The only reason behind is, well, 
Roswell is small. I mean, this is a small town. Um, there are a lot of people that come to the event. They estimate in the tens of thousands, but it is just an estimation. Um, and and they do. I mean, they have more and more hotels. Even when I started going, or let's say about 10 years ago, there's at least five or six more hotels. So there are a lot of hotels. Uh, this year I heard that this was kind of the smallest uh, showing in the last uh, – since – uh, 1997, which was the 50th anniversary, which was huge. Um, but there were still quite a few people. Uh, and the reason I, I say I doubt that is that Albuquerque, for instance, is a very, it's a pretty big town. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. so is Santa Fe. So mm-hmm. Albuquerque is just on a scale, it, it's very, very, very much bigger. And they have events such as the, um, International Balloon Fiesta, which is the oh, largest right. mm-hmm. balloon festival in the world. And uh, there are people that come from all over. I used to go to that. Uh, I would try to go every year. And it was absolutely incredible. Thousands yes. mm-hmm. of hot air balloons in the air at the same time. It's surreal because these things are on the ground and they're huge. And then the air sky is littered with them. Uh, it's incredible. But I'm sure... That gets a lot more people. Oh yeah, that, that um, yeah, that, mm-hmm. that's right. Um, of course that would. Yeah. yeah. So so events like that, and Santa Fe, of course, is is also world renowned, and they have uh, festivals as well. So um, it gets a lot. So uh, maybe uh, there's probably some kind of it's statistic there that's pretty impressive. Probably per capita gets more people than you know. Yeah. Oh, well, no doubt. We'll go with that. that. that yeah. Yeah. That. So what's happening for <laughs> news while you were over there? While I was over there, there wasn't a whole lot of news uh, that uh, I can think of while I was over there. In fact, you know, I left the day after we talked. Right. And uh, I've been back and I'm working on this story. Uh, so I've been researching. So there hasn't been a whole lot of news. While I was there, though, I guess what did I learn? This is kind of interesting. Um Nick Pope told a story, uh, which was a fun story, about um, one of his bosses in the Ministry of Defense who was reviewing a case and um, was essentially talking about how this UFO – oh, this is really cool, actually. This UFO was um, not – this unidentified object that they were trying to investigate was not Soviet. It was not ours. It was not the – um, United States. So who else could it be? And he pointed to the sky and, uh, just kind of an, a neat story. I hadn't heard him tell before. Uh, and him and his coworker there were just like, Whoa, that's kind of weird, but this is kind of cool too. So John Burroughs actually showed up. Really? One of the other Rendlesham witnesses. Right. And mm-hmm. he actually ended up having to do a talk cause they had and I think it was a mix up on the schedule. They had Lee scheduled to do two and he actually got sick um at the mm. end of the first day, so he couldn't do his first one. So John Burroughs went up there and did his talk was which was great. And he talks a lot about Project Condine. And Project Condine was a document that's only come out in the last few years, which was an investigation that was completed in 2000 by the Ministry of Defense into UFOs. So it was a full-on investigation. The problem is, and and this is what John Burroughs talks about, John Burroughs uh, did a lot of great work looking into it, and he found that there was some speculation that perhaps the UFOs are, are a plasma, natural plasma phenomenon that causes radiation and that he and his colleagues may have been affected from the radiation from this plasma. So that's really interesting. Um, But my argument to Nick was this document is very speculative. I mean, they talk a lot about this natural phenomena of plasma and, um, you know, who asked for this document to create, be created and what did they think they would be able to find? And his answer was great. His answer was that it was a secret inquiry and they didn't want anybody to know that they were looking into UFOs, doing the serious inquiry into UFOs. So 
they couldn't really ask scientists and other experts oh. their opinions or ideas about like this plasma phenomena. So they had to limit their research to existing documents. So that limited what they could really discover. Hmm. As for who asked for the document, he said it was UFO believers essentially in the government. I mean, we have them. John Alexander's right. one that was in our military. And uh, so – there were a group of believers in, in several departments, and they felt that uh, what they wanted to do was analyze the topic to see if they can glean any uh, technology that they would be able to use to develop some sort of um, great technology, similar to why Bob Bigelow has gotten into this um, hmm. topic and did his research. So that was kind of interesting Um to, to know the background of that and why it was so speculative and kind of limited, even though it's a huge document. Um, now, limited, you, um, you know, there are so many, only so many UFOs that could be explained as something that was even plasma-like. You that's know? a good point, and that's really the only thing they offer up are kind of plasmas or misidentifications. They don't really... Uh, at least I don't recall them. I think they went into – said something about how it's a possibility. Um, Nick in his talk ha- had some other great quotes from the document. So um, – but yeah, you're right. Can this document be found online? It can. I believe it can. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that's how I found it. But Project Condine and that's C-O-N-D-I-G-N. Oh, OK. Great. Yeah, and otherwise, I'm working on something kind of related. Um, it is a document that, uh, or I'm, I'm essentially, you know, that interview with Paul Dean that I had where he talked about UFO reports being um, reported to this government or military system called OPREP. Um, and in particular, they were OPREP 3. Um, so I'm kind of doing a history of, okay, uh, one of the things we know from Blue Book is that, and we know this from uh, a memo by a general, that the um, UFO reports that had a, a national uh, that were of national defense interest, which would be the most significant ones, were not going to Blue Book at all. They were going to uh, what's called JNAP 146 um, protocols uh, or essentially reporting system, um, and this system. We know so we have some information about. I I talk about it when I talk about the Canadian sightings and stuff. And uh, essentially, it was called Service Merit, and uh, it lists. You know, this is where you have to report UFO sightings, and and that document was in existence up until um, 2011. Oh, wow! When um, Lee Spiegel wrote a story about it, and surprisingly, coincidentally, it vanished. Uh, with it vanished, uh, so you know this story. Yeah. Uh, but uh, John Greenwald has looked into these files. But Paul Dean has found that, um, and I'm going to show this uh, how this has worked. Is that uh, Greenwald tried to look for some of these service reports, UFO reports. They told him there weren't any, and they told him they weren't subject to FOIA anyway. He did find some on the Canadian side. Uh, but uh, as Paul Dean has kind of demonstrated, they probably weren't using that anyway. They were using this op rep system. And essentially, uh, this is kind of interesting, John Greenwald shows that uh, the document that replaced um, in 2011 uh, that service says essentially op rep is where, these, is where the um, important reports go. And uh, so that's evidence that that's where they're going. However, from where do they go there, I don't know. And uh, – they don't share those files. Now, is that is that a, a U.S. Uh, agency? Uh, it is a U.S. reporting system huh. that apparently um, is JNAP is like the Joint uh, Army Navy Air Force reporting system. Navy, yeah, reporting system, and uh, these op reps seem to also be uh, multi departmental and services so it goes to um more than just necessarily you know one service uh, although uh as he's also shown or, or paul dean has shown and, and and i'll show this there are some particular codes that can be used so that it stays within the navy for instance um or goes to uh navy command hmm. um but they go to magcom 
and MAGCOMs are major commands. So those are kind of like the major uh, different departments of uh, the different branches of the service. So you'll have a story on this within the next couple of days that anyone yeah, listening can fact, Right. Check I, out. I hope to have that posted by the end of the day. All right. Great. So all you have to do is go over to openminds.tv, and it should be there by the time you hear this. Alejandro, yeah. thanks so much. All right. Talk to you next week, buddy. All righty. So hang in there, everyone. We'll be right back with Jeremy Meadow. Jeremy, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. Good. Thank you, and welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Sure. Now, um, you're kind of a young guy. Um, uh, when, when did you get uh, started in uh, looking into UFOs? Um, I would say prob- I got involved mainstream, I guess you would call it, around 2008, around the time that I turned 18, 19 years old. Um, I originally found out about the Ely cases actually looking online at different UFO crash lists. And what was weird about this one was not only was it fairly close to where I live, but these crashes basically had no information about them at all on the internet. So, um, I started looking into these cases and there's actually a lot more to it than what the internet says. So when you're researching um, these earlier cases, how do you first start? Is it looking through newspaper articles, uh, books written on the subject? Um, how, do you, how do you look into it to begin um, with? Well, I, um, well, with these specific cases, I actually, like I said, I looked on a list on the Internet of supposed UFO crashes, and I saw that this one was, well, a crash in the Ely, Nevada area was listed on there. Um, I searched the story on YouTube, and there actually was a short news broadcast done by Ed Pierce over in Reno for a KOLO TV. And they listed that the Ely Times newspaper had covered the story. And I contacted the newspaper, and from, from then on, I started one thing led to another, and they gave me the names of a couple witnesses, and I went to the Ely area, and um, I guess the best way to explain it was because I wasn't with big-time media or I wasn't there with a TV crew, that people were more willing to talk to me than they were when the past investigators have gone through there. And um, I just managed to talk to the right people at the right time when I came out there originally, and then now, of course, I see that there's about three or four big UFO stories in the Ely area, ranging from about a 25-year period. Wow. So um, when people were talking to you, would you also get names of other people to speak with as you went along? Oh, yeah. The Ely, Nevada is a very secluded area. It's One of the largest cities, I guess you'd call it a city, I call it a small town in that area, it's about three to 4,000 people, and there's no city larger than 50,000 people for about 200 to 300 miles in any direction. (laughs) You have to go to either Las Vegas to the south, they have Elko, Nevada to the north, and then the northeast, they have Salt Lake City. And um, the majority of the residents in Ely, Nevada, they don't really talk to outsiders, especially if you're from from the media, like if you're from a TV station or if you're from, I don't know, like anywhere, anywhere that's not there, basically, they don't really talk to you. And I managed to get in, I guess, for lack of words, I managed to get an in with the community once I started making friends with some of the people that ran ran the local museums. Hmm. Wow. Uh, So you're, 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 uh, do you mind saying your age? Yeah, I'm 26. So you're 26, and you have a fascination with this. And have you ever had, like, someone just, you know, slam the door on you, so to speak? Um, all the time, actually. We've had, <laughs> we've had lots of people that 
were contacted by the government back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and for some reason, most of them won't say, but some of them have told us, and we could get into that a little bit later, and they were threatened by the government, and they were told that if they, did, if they talked about this again, that something bad would happen to them. Mm-hmm. And I found that out the hard way in 2014. I actually pressed the issue, and I was visited myself by some entity from the government that I call the men in black. And we could get into that a little bit later, too. But um, mm-hmm. lots yep. of people. Lots of, I'd say we talk to more people that are afraid than angry, but you do get the angry people too. Now, when you, yeah, we have to remember to talk about that later because that's really interesting. When you are doing these investigations, do you team up or are you by yourself solo? Um, most of the work is done by myself, but I do have one other person. He's my friend, my best friend. His name's actually Nick, and he's, he actually does ghost hunting with me too, but I, I, I go back and forth between, I'd say, ghost hunting and UFOs, and he's the main one that does both with me. Uh-huh. Now, um, just change, switching around a little bit here, closer to home for you, I've heard, um, and also a, um, someone that helps out with the show also lives in um, Las Vegas, and there are some sightings there. Have you yourself ever had a sighting or have you ever ever investigated a sighting um, in Las Vegas itself? Um, Not in Las Vegas itself, but I I have gone out to Red Rock Canyon, which is just a little bit, I guess you would call it, on the... So I'm trying to think of the the directions here. It's on the western side of Las Vegas in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the strangest things that I had happen to me, I'd say was probably about 2010. It was me, my brother, and our friend Nick, and our other friend Brent. We were driving through Red Rock Canyon, actually, to investigate a story that we were covering about a mass UFO sighting out in the village of Blue Diamond. And we had gone out there, and we had talked to some witnesses, and there was nothing really going on. It was just pitch black mountains, just but you would picture with the wilderness. And on the way back to Las Vegas, which is about a 30-minute drive out of town, I we went around this bend, and all of a sudden, the whole entire car lit up the color red, like a fluorescent red color. But there was no other cars on the road besides us, and it was this was in the middle of the night. And there was no explanation for where this light came from. It looked like it was coming through the windshield from up above us somewhere, or coming from the mountains somewhere, but there's no town out there, just that small town I was telling you about, a blue diamond, and that's only about 100 people. And we had already driven out of town and had gone deep into the mountains. So that was strange. I don't mm. know if you would call that UFO phenomenon, but I have no explanation other than something UFO-related to what that could have been. Hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, I have a friend who's actually, she was on the uh, Home and Garden Network or something like that. But um, she contacted me one day and said, oh, you do a show on UFOs. And then she started to tell me about her sighting she had. And it was right in Las Vegas itself, right in the city. She said she was uh, uh, stepping outside of her hotel room. She said she something caught her eye and she looked over and she said it was a huge black triangle about dusk. It wasn't even, she didn't see lights or anything, just a triangle floating along. And... Uh, I'm just surprised I've never heard anyone else talk about that because, you know, there's so many uh, people in that city. You just oh, yeah. just think you'd hear more about triangle sightings there. Um, but all interesting. Now, we have someone on the message board that just wants to you to elaborate a little bit more on the uh, men in black visit. So why don't we just uh, go into that? What happened exactly? Um, yeah, I could go into that. Um, I guess the best way to explain it... Um, I've been to the Ely area probably about between 10 and 15 times. And I also travel around different states around the country interviewing witnesses. But the main sighting took place in 2014, but I have to rewind a little bit to 2008. When I first started investigating the Ely UFO crash, 
I was looking for information, and I called Hill Air Force Base, and I ca- which is in Ogden, Utah, and I called Nellis Air Force Base, which is in Las Vegas. And I sent in a request. I didn't say I was looking for UFOs at the time, not right off the bat. And I got a call from someone who said that he was a base historian from Air Force Base. Hmm. And... This guy called me. He didn't say his name, which I thought was kind of odd. odd. And this man calls, and he's, he's looking for me. And he says, okay, well, how could I help you? And I said, okay, well, I'm looking for, I'm, look, I'm doing a story on a strange aerial crashes that take place in White Pine County, which is where Ely's at, in the early, early 1950s. And the guy goes, okay, okay. And he starts asking me for more information. And I tell him, okay, well, I'm looking for stories that, either do or don't have to do with fatalities, but they're strange. And he goes, well, what do you mean by strange crashes? And I say, well, you know, something that might have come from space. And you can tell the guy knew what I was getting at. And he, you can tell the guy starts smiling or he's ready to start laughing. And he goes, well, those types of crashes are classified before I could even say anything about UFOs. Hmm. And finally, I tell the guy I was looking for UFOs and he starts telling, giving, all of a sudden his story changes and he says, okay, well, if, you wanna, if you're looking for stories like that, those, those stories are classified. But if you come down to the base in person, we have a logbook that you're welcome to look at. And I, and I got kind of spooked for the moment, moment and I was telling him, okay, well, no thanks. Uh, You've, I've already talked to you long enough. You know, I was going to try to get going. And the guy kept trying to have me go down to the base. I don't know why. But hmm. after the guy found out that I wasn't going to go down to the base, his story switched again. And he started asking me about my college. I was in college at the time. He started asking me about my college professors and what I was doing for a living at the time. And just kind of some off-the-wall questions. And I just kind of told the guy what he wanted to hear. I answered his questions because uh, and, and in that situation, I was like, well, the military's on the phone right down. The, the base is literally right down the street. I can't really hang up on this guy. Or... Hmm. Hmm. So we ended our conversation, and this was our first or second trip to Ely. Yeah, me and my friend Nick like, were getting ready to go up there to interview this woman, and she still lives in the Ely area. And we were supposed to go to Ely, I think it was on a Thursday or a Friday. And around Monday or Tuesday, I get a call from this woman saying, oh, well, thanks for, thank you for doing your interview. You guys are really professional, and you guys asked all kinds of interesting questions. And she starts telling me about this interview. And I'm just sitting there silent, listening to what this woman has to say. And finally, when she's done, I told her, I was like, well, that wasn't us. We're, we're in Las Vegas. We, we're not supposed to be there for two more days. And she got really scared. And I guess she thought someone was posing as me and my friend Nick. And whoever it was was telling her the same information I gave the base historian on the phone, posing as me, talking about my college professors, where I worked, um, the cars... I, yeah, so I don't know who that was, but that had something to do with the conversation I had with the military base historian. And that was, and the woman got so scared that she hung up the phone and never talked to us again. I still don't know to this day what her story was because she won't answer her phone. She won't respond to us. But the moral of the story is that for some reason, Early on, I found out that the government or the military, whatever you want to call them, they're still paying attention to this story. Mm. All right, so... How long ago was was that? That was about 2009, 2010. Mm. And things kind of died down for a little while. And I was on the Open Minds radio show, actually, with Alejandro Rojas, ironically. (laughs) And I was supposed to take another trip to Ely. This is in 2014. And I guess I worked the graveyard shift at a casino here in Las Vegas. And I come home from work anywhere between 10 and 10 o'clock at noon. And on this specific day, I was looking at my blog post from that day. It was September 11th, 2014. 
um, I got home from work, and there was nobody out in the whole entire neighborhood. And I parked my car in the driveway, and I went inside because I had my girlfriend at the time. I was trying to ask her if she wanted to go to the grocery store with me. And, of course, she didn't want to because that's just, how I guess, how she was. And I came out of the house. I looked around, and there was nobody outside. And all of a sudden, I, I sat in my car. I opened the door. I sat in the driver's chair, and both of my feet were still hanging out of the car, but I was physically sitting in the driver's seat. Uh, there was a white sedan with blacked-out windows comes screeching around the corner, slams on its brakes, almost like you would see in the movies, and it's blocking me in almost like a, like a T-bone shape, but behind the car, like a, I, I don't know what you call it, like a shape like a T. And I stood up, and the way I went around the car, I walked around the hood of my car, go starting from the driver's side door, walking around the hood, coming, up, coming back up by the passenger side. And as I was coming around the back side of the car... I saw that there was a white license plate with silver letters, and it said "Government or U.S. government official use only." And in my head, I remember I I really remember myself vividly thinking, "Oh man, this isn't going to be good." So, yeah. all of a sudden, a guy gets out of the single man gets out of the vehicle, and he's wearing a military fatigue, almost to look like like a soldier gets out. And the first thing he says, he doesn't introduce himself, and he doesn't ask me who I am, almost like he knew who I was. And the guy said, did you find the UFO yet? This is how we started our conversation. Really? He says, well, yeah, he said, did you find the UFO yet? And I answered no. And I paused for a minute. And I was like, not yet, because in my head I'm trying to put this together as what was going on. And the guy said, well, I heard that you're looking for him. Did you find him? And... I got kind of sarcastic at that point, and I told the man that, uh, no, I'm headed to the grocery store at the moment, and that I didn't want to talk about it. And there was kind of a pause there for a minute, and the man says, he starts getting back in his car, and he says, tell your friend Nick that I said hi. And huh. he gets back in the car and drives about two or three houses down and stops in front of our mailbox. And I thought this was kind of bizarre, and this all happened so quickly at, the, at, the point, at that point in time that I didn't really have any chance to ask this man any questions. So he drove a couple houses down and stopped. I get in my car, and I pull out of our neighborhood. And he looks like he's writing something down on like a notepad or a clipboard in the driver's seat with the uh, sitting there. So close to my house, there's a stop sign and once you pass through the stop sign, there's a U-Haul business, and then there's a bridge you have to go over to get to the grocery store. I got to the stop sign, and there was no cars there at all. And once I passed through the stop sign, I passed the U-Haul place, a white SUV with blacked-out windows, and the same, co the same license plate pulls out of this U-Haul business and follows me all the way to the grocery store. And at this point in time, I was thinking, uh-oh. This is the kind of thing you hear about when you read these UFO websites or you watch these documentaries or movies. I thought that someone was going to either try to, I don't know if they were going to try to arrest me or if they were going to try to interrogate me or something. So I went, in the I went to the grocery store and I parked in the handicapped spot in the front in case someone was going to confront me in that SUV. And they stopped, uh, they almost went to a stop, almost like a California stop, I slowed down. And of course, since it's a, since it's a grocery store. All right, you guys there? Sorry, I said my microphone wasn't detected for a second there. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah. All right, yeah, so anyway, so since I pulled in the, the handicap spot, since it's a grocery store, there's all kinds of people walking around. Nobody got out of the SUV. They just kept on going. So things mm. at this point are kind of building up. I don't know who the soldier was, and he said, tell your friend Nick that I said hi. First thing I did, I went to the grocery store. I called my friend Nick. I was going to tell him some man is going to come to your house or some guy is looking for you in a military outfit. Well, I called him, and he didn't answer his phone. And I called him, and I called him, and I didn't hear from Nick for about a year. And Nick was my best friend throughout all my childhood. And it took him about, I'd say I said about a year, year and a half, till he came back around. But during that year, I found out that the military 
or somebody similar to the military, like I would think this man was, they came and visited him before they came to my house. And at the, that point in time, he was trying to get into the military himself. And they told him that he was never going to get into the military and he was never going to be able to graduate college if he continued looking for the UFOs. And they told him that he would never be able to get into the military or he would basically never have a career. And this scared Nick. They didn't threaten his life or anything. They just threatened his career, I guess, and his job and his college. But to this day, he still won't tell me what the person told to him, and he still won't acknowledge that they talked to him. The only reason I know is that some mutual friends had told me and my brother that this had happened. Nick, to this day, he gets really quiet and won't talk about it. So I don't exactly know what that was all about. Wow. But this is... It, uh stuff you kind of hear about but uh uh i think you're probably one of the first people i've talked to that's had an, an encounter from a supposed a supposed government official of some kind about someone that's concerned enough about a ufo case that they actually want you to uh turn away from it yeah and this is a historical case Yes, this is this the case specifically that we're talking about. There's two of them. One's from 1952. The other one is from 1964. And those, one of those two is the one that got the government excited about um, what we were looking for. And that's what was causing them to come over here. Unbelievable. Well, we're going to talk about the July 7th, 1952 saucer collision over northern Utah in hour two. And that, you know, just in a few hours, that's coming up on the 64th anniversary of that, just in a oh, couple yeah. of hours. Uh, so one of the questions that popped up on the message board was uh, someone wanted to know, did the person that actually got out of the white SUV or whatever it was, um, or the car, I guess it was, did they look peculiar or was it just a regular person? It just looked like a regular person. I didn't see, he didn't have any guns or anything that I saw, at least on him. It might have been in the car, but I didn't see any guns on this person. They're just wearing a normal military outfit. But um, something interesting that kind of links the story together. About a year later, which was in August of 2015, I was coming home from work and I got a call from my brother saying that there was a white unmarked cargo van with blacked out windows and the government license plate I was telling you about sitting out front of our house. <laughs> and people always ask me, okay, Jeremy, well, why don't you take a picture of the man in the uniform or take a picture of the sedan? Because, of course, I, I, to this day, I regret not taking the guy's picture. And at the time, I was kind of afraid, wondering what would have happened if I did take his picture out in the open with my camera phone. So I was doing interviews, and people always asked me why I didn't take a picture. Well, this time, I came around the corner coming home from work, and when I came around the corner, whoever was sitting in the cargo van saw me pulling into the driveway, and they started pulling off. Like, they didn't want me to see them, or they didn't want me to approach them. And as they were driving off, I actually did take a picture of their vehicle driving away with my camera phone. Hmm. Yeah. And um, I didn't was driving the car but i sent you the picture and i have a picture of the vehicle on a couple different places on the internet oh um someone wants to know on the message board by the way if you're listening live you can jump over to podcastufo.com and go into the message board if you're listening on psn radio you can also go into their skype chat and i uh, will see a message if it comes up uh matt has a question he wanted to know if your girlfriend um, was ever confronted or talked to or intimidated? Um, not that I know of. Because, I mean, I have a new girlfriend now, but that girlfriend, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She didn't want to go to the grocery store, so you got rid of her, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I guess she stayed in the house the whole time I was confronted outside, and she said nobody that she knows of came back to the house. But since I took the picture of the vehicle, I have heard from my brother, at least on one or two other occasions, that... The vehicles were outside the house. Wow. And there was yeah. one time, um, one time I actually came home from work and there was someone that was posing as a, they said that they were a realtor asking about our house. And what was kind of peculiar about it is, again, we were getting ready to get back to Ely and they're asking us questions about selling our house and we're renting our house. So I, I would have no idea about that. And um, 
when they were done talking to me, they walked across the street and got in their car. And of course, it was a white sedan with black same license plate again. The guy got back in the car. That was that was that kind of freaked me out because that that person was just dressed in a suit and tie like a normal person. But again, though, they did get in a car with a strange license plate and the blacked out windows. Yeah. Well, let's look at this logically, or try to anyway. I mean, a uh-huh. few times things make logic when it comes to UFOs. But why would they expend this effort in, uh, in like? you know, searching you out, talking to you, um, semi-threatening Nick in all this, why would they expend that type of energy for an old case? Why, why would you, what did you come up with? Well, the best explanation that I have is I got onto the case, or cases in this, in this sense, around 2008. And I know that there was people before me in the 1970s and the 1980s and the early 2000s that tried to cover the cases, but they couldn't find any new information out. They kind of reached a bunch of dead ends. And this includes George Knapp. Like I said, it had Ed Pierce. I know there's a group, I'm trying to think what they're called, the, they write the New Atlantean Journal magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, Willard McIntyre or McIntyre. I, he's actually the original investigator of the case, and I got in touch with him. I'll get into that in a minute. But So there's a bunch of people tried to get into this, but no one could find any new information or much information besides what was on the Internet. I came along, like I said, and I started talking to new witnesses who those people had never talked to. And I was openly reopening the case, I guess you could say, because I was doing interviews and I was putting ads out on the newspapers out there and all that sort of thing. Oh, and really? Think, you put some ads in the newspaper? Yeah, I put ads in the Ely newspaper, the Las Vegas Review Journal. Um, I was actually featured in the Ely, newspaper, Ely Daily Times newspaper a few different times. Um, it's really started taking off once I was contacted by an individual who says that they were actually, lo- the, they were actually on, on location when the UFO had crashed and that they were actually threatened by the government back in the winter of 1952. And if you'd like, I could get started with that story. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, well, when you look up the Ely, if you type in Ely UFO crash, besides the information that I found, the most that you'll find is a date. And it's in the, I think it's August 12th, 1952 is what comes up. And you just see that it says 16 bodies, Ely, Nevada. Well, the story goes, this popular story that you see on the internet goes, during the night shift in the Robinson Copper Mine, which is right outside of Ely, Nevada, it's 12 miles away, and the city is called Ruth. Ruth, Nevada was built as a company town for this massive copper mine. It's the second or third biggest copper mine in North America. And it was owned by the Kennecott Corporation at the time. So... During the night shift, there was a security guard who told all the locals that he saw a flaming object crash into the, one of the mining pits in this copper mine during the night shift. And he doesn't say exactly what this object looked like. He says it was a glowing flame. And he states that he was told never to talk about this again, and he was swore to secrecy, and he took this story to his grave. That was the first story that I, that's one of the only stories actually when I first came to Ely. I started telling the story to different individuals and they go, oh yeah, well you're looking for Pete. And I go, okay, well, okay, now I get this guy's name. His name's Pete. Well, I start asking around about Pete and I, and I run into a couple other individuals. One guy, he actually is the grandson of someone that worked back then. And he says that his version of the story was that in the winter of 1952, he didn't have an exact date, he says a glowing object, which wasn't on fire, I've asked him, he says this was not on fire, came crashing into the, on the edge of one of the mining pits. Because on the internet, it sounds like this thing crashed in one of the pits. This thing, according to this, this guy's story, says that it crashed on the edge of one of the mining pits. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with mine with the way mines work and the 
terminology, but the exact word is the high wall. The high wall is the tallest point in a mine before you start taking the little roundabout trails that go down into the bottom. And I don't exactly know where the security guard claimed he was when he saw this, but this person, the new person I was mentioning, he was actually working in the mine, in this pit when it happened. And he says that this thing crashed into a snowbank. They thought that a small plane had crashed. And whoever was in charge of the mine at the time had called emergency services, and whoever that was, I think, had called the military. So... This object comes down from the sky and it crashes into a snowbank. He says that the object, according to his grandfather, it wasn't damaged. Like there was no rips in the metal. There was no broken glass or anything. It was just kind of sitting there and it was glowing. Mm -hmm. And while this thing was glowing, I guess eventually the police arrived at the main entrance to the mine, which is right on the edge of the town of Ruth, like I said, because Ruth is literally built right next to this copper mine and the the police got there and they didn't want they didn't want the civilians seeing this glowing object so they started making the miners leave out the main entrance of the mine well while the people were while the workers and the people the civilians were being scuffled away from the area the military had actually entered the backside of the mine and they were actually coming from Ely themselves they used to have a national guard unit there up until the early 1980s And they were actually reinforced eventually by Hill Air Force Base in Ogden, Utah. And they picked this object up while the media was eventually coming to the area. The story that the mining people were told was that this small plane had crashed and they were sticking to that story. And that's people that are skeptical of this. They still think to this day that this was a small plane that had crashed. And the military eventually picked up the the bulk of the craft, and I don't know if there was little pieces laying in the snow, they don't really say, but the bulk of the craft, which is spherical shaped and metallic silver silver looking with no windows, was picked up and put onto a flatbed truck and it was driven out the backside of the mine while all the, I guess you call it the fuss, all the fuss was going on at the main entrance. They went out the back entrance, which was not known by very many people, and they drove it to Ogden, or Hill Air Force Base in Ogden, Utah. And I guess nowadays you wouldn't even know where this UFO crash site was unless someone that worked there told you where it was. And nowadays there's not very many people that even believe in the story, not to mention know where this thing supposedly happened. Something interesting, though. There was a project run by the, by the U.S. Air Force called Operation High Range. Operation or Project High Range, sorry, worded that wrong. Project High Range was, uh, was started in 1955, and the purpose of this project was to track the X-15 rocket plane. There was three or four different locations ranging from Palmdale, California, go up from Edwards Air Force Base, going up to Beatty, Nevada, going to Ely, then it goes up to Hill Air Force Base. So the planes would take off and... Go, they'd, they'd fly really fast through this straight line, this diagonal line, and they would track them. So the cover story was that they built this site on top of the mountain originally to track the X-15 rocket plane. And in 1979, up until 1979, the U.S. Air Force ran this site, and then eventually this site was given over to NASA, and then NASA ended up running it until the 90s, and then they claimed that they gave up the site. Well, I talked to a couple people that had worked at the site throughout the 1970s and 80s, and they said the purpose of the site after the X-15 rocket plane was done being tested was to track missiles and unidentified flying objects like UFOs. And if you notice... There's a couple of different UFO crashes around the country that I know of, at least. I know people claim that there was a similar tracking station was built close to Roswell. Um, I know Aztec, New Mexico, there's a similar, a similar uh, radar tower. And then I was also talking to Harry Drew, who did the Kingman, Nevada Air, the Kingman, Nevada UFO crash. And I know they have another uh, tracking station similar to that was built there years after that happened. So... For some reason, 
one reason or another, the U.S. military was thinking that if a UFO had crashed in an area, that they would either be back in the future at some point in time or that there would be U other UFO sightings in that same exact area. Um, hmm. So nowadays, if you, the base is now abandoned on top of the mountain, you could go up there. It's, there's still signs saying you could be shot for going up there or that you'd be arrested on the spot, the, the old vintage signs. And I know not that, not that very many people go up to the site nowadays, but we went up there a couple different times. The first time we went up there, um, we're looking out towards the crash site where we were told to look, and you, it just looks like a plain patch of dirt. You can't tell that anything was ever happening there. But besides the fact, we got up to the top of the, the top of Kimberly Mountain. It's called Kimberly Peak. It's kind of it's by the Keystone Junction by Ruth and Ely. The there's a, like a little guard shack, I guess you would call it, or like a little shack on top of this mountain. There's a bunch of old radar equipment up there. You could tell that they were from the 1960s or 80s. And the door was cracked on this little shack. This is, of course, this is of course the short version of the story, so we could get into a little bit of discussion. Mm -hmm. um, it was me, my brother, and our friend Nick. And we, up, we, we were up on top of the mountain. Like I said, the door was cracked on this, sh on this shack that was on top of the mountain, and there was no other cars up there besides us. My friend Nick, he peers through this crack in the door, and he gets this really freaked out, excited look on his face. And we kind of look at him, wondering what he was looking at. He pops the door open using a couple fingers, and when the door creaks open, there was probably about eight or ten computers that looked like they're from the 1980s, and they're the kind that had the black background with the green letters. Mm -hmm. And they were running some kind of code. It looked like it was like scanning for something. I don't know if it was weather patterns or what it was, but I have some news articles from the Ely Times newspaper saying that they supposedly stopped using the site in 1992, I think it was. And they were still using it. This was 2012 or so, 2010. So I don't know what they're doing up there, but they're still using that site for something. Because, like I said, we saw the computers. Wow. So you were able to actually get that close. Yeah, you could go up there. Usually the shack is locked up, and there's never, there's never been anyone up there. And we've been up there, I'd say, about five times. Hmm. Now, um, when you the, – the case that you actually were visited – um, on was that this case or was it the other one we're going to get um, into later? This one was the one where the guy was impersonating me and my friend Nick was ah. about the 1952 uh, mine crash story I just said. Mm -hmm. That one was the first story. The other two where I got the picture and where the guy confronted me was are going to be the next one. I see. Uh huh. Okay. So um, were there any witnesses? Now you mentioned the media was on the way out there when, um, when this crash happened, were there any witnesses that have come forward? And you said that people actually saw uh, this being loaded on a flatbed or it was supposedly. So where did you get that information? Um, there's not very many witnesses to the 1950. Just some of them come from the mine security who had to secure the area before the military and the, the National Guard unit got there. And a lot of the other stories actually come from people that had just happened to be out in the neighborhood when whatever it was came from the sky and crashed into the snowbank. One of the most popular stories comes from a guy named Claude House. And he said that they were having some kind of a dinner party at the time, I was told. And the, one of the sheriffs from Ely was actually at their house. And they were all in the front yard and they saw the thing come down and crash into the snowbank. Hmm. And a uh, uh, lot of the stories about the object on the truck come from the Duckwater Indian Reservation. The Duckwater Indian Reservation is close to that road, which is the, the, back, the back entrance to the mine where the trucks were going to Hill Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. People that happen to be out and about or that heard all the trucks and the commotion, I think, if you ask me, I think they were probably woken up by the sound of all the trucks and the and the military cruising through town at night, because Duckwater is a small place. And I know for a fact, people in Ruth and people in Duckwater said that there was military police with Pearl, the 
the exact words I was given were pearl handled sidearms mm. were going from door to door for at least two weeks afterwards, confronting people, asking what they had seen. And if they had seen anything, they were told not to talk about it. So most of those types of stories come from the Indian reservation, but the actual loading onto the flat bed, most of those stories come from the mine security, the actual witnessing of it being put onto the trucks. Okay. Um, someone asked if these pictures or any pictures can be seen uh, online, and you have a website. You can go ahead and give that out if you would. Um, the, my main website, the best way to find me is if you click on my Paranormal Team's website, which is bigfootspad.com, and there's links to my personal blog and my UFO website that talks about the Ely stuff. That's probably the best, the easiest way to do it. Yeah, okay, and there are some pictures. I know you sent me a bunch of them. So the next one that I'd like to talk about before we um, get into the, the crash that... Uh, we're definitely going to talk about coming up on its 64th anniversary is that let's talk about, is it the train? Is it a train wreck or, or, or something like um, that? Yeah. Well, originally, like I said, I came to Ely looking for this 1952 story. And originally I thought that was the only story that existed. And I was featured in the Ely times newspaper. I think it was around Halloween time. I have the article saved. I'd have to look at the date, but I think it was around Halloween time couple years back and uh the article listed my phone number and my email on there and it said if you want to if you have information give me a call or give me an email and i got woken up by some guy an old an older an older guy he called me saying that in 1962 or 1964 he didn't recall at the time he says that he was on a he was working for the nevada northern railway which it runs from that copper mine I was just telling you about up to a town called McGill. McGill is a town where they would smelt the copper after they mined it out of the town of Ruth. And then once they smelted it, they put it back on the train and bring it up to Salt Lake City or some other place up north to sell it. Well, anyway, so this guy was hauling a batch of ore, copper ore, from the Robinson Copper Mine going north. And he says they came around a bend in the tracks... And his exact words were that the tracks were torn and thrown like pretzels. And this man, who was the brake man on the train, he hit the brakes, he was, or either hit the brakes or was told to hit the brakes, and the train stopped in an area where the tracks were destroyed, and the, I guess the train had a partial derailment, he was saying. And when they finally came to a halt and they could collect themselves, they said they looked off to the, to the side and you could see that there was some sort of a skid in the ground, like something had hit the tracks and then bounced off and skidded and settled in some, some sagebrush and some desert plants at the base of a mountain. Well, he says that while they were sitting there, that there was some female ranchers that were in the area, and they had actually rode up to this craft. And again, it was just similar to the other one from 1952. It was spherical. It was metallic looking with no windows, but this one had a hole torn in one of the sides. And he said that there was all kinds of debris thrown around. The debris, I was told, looked like a green, it looked like, a, looked like glass, but it had a green metallic tint to it, almost like, like glitter is what I was told. And I guess these female ranchers picked up some of this material, and they were, some of them actually, there was three or four of them, they actually climbed on top of this object were, and were examining this. And eventually they got back on their horses and rode off, and the military arrived a little bit later. And the military arrived. They blocked off, they blocked off all the roads nearby. They picked up all the people off the train and brought them back to the Ely jail where they interrogated these people. And once the train's crew was out of sight, there's the story gets kind of weird. I guess the disc was tipped upside down. I call it a disc. It was tipped upside down, like I said, and there was a hole ripped in it. I was told by one of the men that was part of the Nevada 9th National Guard that whoever was in charge of their group actually walked inside the craft and looked around. And according to that, according to the secondhand witness, I don't know if you call him a secondhand witness, he was on the side at the time, but he was 
he was on guard duty, his boss or his whoever was in charge was off in the craft at the time. He said that it looked like he was standing on the desert floor, that you couldn't even tell that you were standing inside of a ship or a craft, if you say, if you want to use, call it that. And he said the only thing you could tell, the only reason you could tell that you were inside a craft is that you could see that green glitter around you. And he said that he was in the craft for what he thought was a few minutes, but it turned out that it was close to an hour, I guess. I don't know if he just lost track of time or if time slowed down while he was in there. I'm not exactly sure. So he walks in the craft and looks around. He walks out, and he starts ordering the object to be picked up. Well, the story goes that this object was so big and was caught up in the sagebrush that they had to get a crane to pick it up. Well, the biggest crane in the county at the time was a wrecking crane that was for the Nevada Northern Railway. And this crane was brought on rail, like like, like a train. But in order to get the crane there, they had to move the train that was filled with ore. So... I went to the Nevada Northern Railway Museum on a couple different occasions trying to find documentation for this. And um, I can't find any documentation saying where this train went or where this train... There's proof that the train came from Ruth, but there's no documentation saying it arrived anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what happened. I asked, how would you take apart a train or how would you go about moving it? And Sean Pitts, who's the who's the, the historian at the museum or the curator, however you want to say that, he told me that they come off in pieces. They have the main box, I guess, the main box car. Then they have the undercarriage. And if you want to get technical, you could break, break that up into other pieces. So the best story I could put together is that they brought this crane down the tracks. They, picked, they disassembled the train as quickly as they could. And eventually, they picked up the UFO and put it on a truck using this crane. And the story gets more interesting from here. So they picked up the the UFO, they put it on the trucks, and they drive off. Well, I was contacted by an individual who used to live on the... I'm trying to think what the ranch is called. On the Bassett Lake. He used to live in a place called Bassett Lake, which is out in that general area. And he told me that back in the 1960s, he said he was, he was a young boy. I think he was about seven at the time. And he was telling me that his mom had a similar story. This is, like, this is a little bit later after I talked to the, the guys that were on the train that day. Um, I was, this guy called me, and he said that his mom actually rode out on horseback one day and saw something similar to what I was looking for. So again, it turns out that his mom was one of those female ranchers that I had mentioned earlier. And he brought me out to the, he told me the general area where the crash site was. And he said that his mom still had pieces of this in a box, and that it was a family heirloom. Hmm. And he, he described the same thing to me, he said it looked like jagged pieces of glass with a metallic green glitter look to it. And I asked the guy if I could visit him, because at the time, he's moved away now, but at the time he was living on the ranch. And he told me that he'd have to ask his mom if I could go check out this, these pieces of wreckage or whatever you want to call it. And shortly after, they moved away, and then I never heard from him again. I tried to contact him a few years ago, and he said his mom was, un, was not interested in talking to me. I don't know if she got scared or what, but um, there's pieces of it still out there. Wow. But conti- continuing on. I mean, uh, just, just stop right that? there just for a second. That. You know, if uh, I know uh, people have talked about, you know, finding anomalous uh, objects or something, you know, related to a crash and they've tested it and they've come back and have said that they're, you know, earth more like earthly compound or um, one of them was uh, no compound has been found uh, of the elements put together like that. So. It would be, I mean, you know, you think of all the elements in the universe, you know, perhaps we have um, all of them here. It's possible. And uh, so there may never be like a smoking gun evidence if uh, unless something's completely not found on this earth type of thing. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you know what I mean by the elements? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But it'd still be really interesting to test something like that. And so is that, that's basically a dead end on that. What? Can you uh, hear? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. All so, right. I was told that we were supposed to look for a specific myometer. If and then some, someone the people came in. Okay, we're, we're having a little bit of a sound issue here. We. Uh, Can you hear me? Oh, with, yeah. All right. Um, so I have your phone number, but go ahead and continue. Let's see if it'll it'll straighten itself out. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? I can now. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we were told we were told to uh, go look for a specific mile marker because of the railroad. The railway was stopped stopped being used in the seventies, so the train tracks are all overgrown and they haven't been used in ages. So they're basically impossible to find where something like this happened unless you were told where to look by somebody, especially if you don't live there. Um, well, we were shown by an informant, we were told that there was two ranches in the area at the time, two major ranches where these ladies would have rode out from. And again, the guy who called about the, the, the glass material, he told us where they used to live. And... The train tracks run right along the edge of this property, and we were told again that there was a mountain. So there was like a it happened at the bottom of a mountain. So there was a mountain there, and we walked the tracks. Later, we visited them multiple times, but we walked the tracks, and right where this mileage marker was, which was on a bend, there was a portion of like a long strip a long strip of soil that was a dark yellow copper color. Well, the mine has a dump site where they dump their mine tailings and their waste materials somewhat nearby. And this specific site that we found next to this mile marker was not owned by the mine at any point in time. It was owned by the railroad, but the railroad was a separate entity from the actual mine. So this was kind of odd. Because the train tracks, it goes the train tracks, if you picture this in your mind, on the far right there's train tracks, which are kind of on a raised up platform, platform of dirt. Then there's a ditch in the middle on the left of the tracks filled with water, which was used for irrigation. And on the left side is just farmland and dirt roads and farmland on the left. Well, this strip of dirt was on the far right side, on the right side of this ditch, and it's in like a straight strip. And you could see that somebody dumped that there. And off to the side, on the other side of that ditch, there's a very large crescent moon-shaped portion of land with more of that copper-colored soil, like someone dumped it there a long time ago. And this started to make sense to us. Because they said that, that something had come from the sky and hit the tracks, and it was laying either on someone's farm or close to someone's farm. And it was on a bend in the tracks, and it was by um, someplace in the vicinity of Ely, Nevada. So, um, a little bit later, we went back to the Nevada Northern Railway Museum and talked to the curator, Sean Pitts. And Sean had told us that he didn't believe in this story. Well, I told him that we found the mile marker that we were looking for, and we found this portion of this long strip of dirt. Well, he, he looked in the records, and there was no record of the mine or the, not the mine, the railroad ever repairing those tracks or putting that dirt there. But what was kind of odd was I mentioned that there was a giant wrecking crane, the biggest one in the county at the time, was supposedly used to pick up the UFO. And he told us that this wrecking crane was still on display at the museum as part of their tour. And we looked at this wrecking crane. He said it had a 30-foot boom on the crane. And it would have made sense that they would have needed this wrecking crane to pick up the UFO because it would have had to pick it up out of that farmer's field, lift it over the ditch, 
and put it onto a flatbed truck, the flatbed truck would have been on the service road that ran next to the tracks. So we, this was in April we found out. We found this crash site, by the way. So we're, we have to go back there later this year and do some tests on the area and all that. But we're pretty sure we found the area. It's right. All the clues match up, and it's where the people said, said it would be. The only thing that's kind of a bummer is that a lot of the people are not here anymore because, again, this was 1962, 1962, mm -hmm. 1964. I think it was June 1964, but some people will argue differently about it. And um, that story was actually like a local legend until we started looking into this. And there's actually more evidence to support the 1960s train story than the 1952 crash I had mentioned earlier. I mean, there's witnesses for both, but there's a lot more witnesses for the train story because this was a little bit later and this was after UFOs went mainstream media and all that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So 1952, getting back to that year, was a real big year for as far as uh, UFOs go. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, Matthew made a good point. Have you, well, I don't know if you would have the equipment for it, but uh, has anyone tested that uh, crane for, or have you thought about testing that crane for radiation? Um, I thought about it because we're going to get Geiger counters and different types of equipment and head back out there. Sean, Sean and the guys at the museum are really nice people. We're hoping to do that, but I've never asked. I know that the museum is owned by the state, and generally the state won't acknowledge UFOs or they won't let you do tests and things on equipment for things like that. Because yeah. I know, like I said, we do ghost hunting also. also they won't even let us do that usually, and that's not even touching their stuff. <laughs> You mean like you, you try to go through the trouble of getting permission and you're denied? Is that what it is? Yeah, usually if you try to go through like trying to either write written permission or call around, usually people won't let you do it if it's run by the state for some reason. I think because Ely's a small town and they know who I am, they might let me do it. But uh, at this point in time, I haven't asked or anything. Huh. Wow, that's something. Okay, um, I forgot to mention if anyone wants, if anyone wants to call on the show... Um, you're welcome to call and ask our guests uh, a question. Um, I've had issues with the phone a couple of times, but I'm willing to give it a try if, if anyone wants to dial. It's 603-967-4030. If you're also listening live, you, if you're listening on PSN radio, you can send a message through the Skype chat or over at uh, podcastufo.com. <clears throat> Pardon me. So um, before we get into the um, July 7th crash, um, you actually uh, go into paranormal. Is there a lot going on in, in the Las Vegas area for paranormal, or do you branch out such as you did for the UFO crashes? Um, most of our, if we're going to do something other than UFOs, usually Las Vegas isn't a very good area just because there's not very many old buildings or the people don't generally stay here for very long before they go on to other places. We spend a lot of time in northern Nevada and California and uh, Arizona generally, but there's not too many places to do like ghost hunting or things like that around here. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I can see that. And... Well, um, before we move on to that, just one last question. Where is, do people actually see uh, Bigfoot in like Utah or I'm thinking of these wide open skies and deserts like Arizona, places like that? I mean, have you ever investigated one of those? Um, there's something, well, I mean, we go to Northern California and all that where you hear about it all the time, the popular sightings. We go to those places, but... There's something called the Sand Yeti. It's supposed to be a Bigfoot-type creature that lives in the forests of Arizona and parts of southern Nevada. And I didn't believe in it at first until we started actually looking for these, trying to seek people that had seen these creatures. And now we have like a big old stack of sightings, mostly from Arizona. Wow. Well, Arizona is also diverse. There's places like uh, Flagstaff where... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you can get into, um, you know, more of uh, tree coverage, too, as well. Oh, and yeah. 
And, uh, yeah, when I say the sandy, I don't mean it's walking around in the scrub brush. It's in the, it's in the forest. Ah, uh-huh, uh-huh. All right, well, let's talk about the uh, July 7th uh, crash. Um, this was, uh, was it one of the first ones you really looked into deeply? Um, well, I originally looked for the, the copper mine crash, the 1952 one. Mm-hmm. And when I was looking, at, actually, before I got started out traveling around the country or, and all that, this actually came up on Project Blue Book. And then from Project Blue Book, I found some names, and then I went on from there. Wow. So you really, you really go deep into this um, for investigating. Um, so let's, let's uh, hear the details of this particular one. All right. Well, this one, this one for your audience, you have to pay close attention to the, because the end of the story won't make a lot of sense. And I've been on other radio shows where people got kind of confused. Um, this is actually on July 7th, 1952, which was, what, five years to the day the Roswell crash happened, too? Um, yeah, it was about that. It was, um, uh, they, some people say the 7th, some people say the 8th. Um, mm-hmm. The 8th is when the, I know, is when they flew the uh, debris over and, you know, said that it was a, a weather balloon. Um, so I think it was somewhere around there. But I think that uh, Max Braswell also uh thought he heard like thunderclap and possibly a crash on the 6th. So I don't know if anyone mm-hmm. knows the exact day that that actually happened. Oh, okay. Well, ironically, it's close to today's date too. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, well, the story begins that around 1030 in the morning over Ogden, Utah and Salt Lake, Utah, witnesses, this was a Sunday morning, I think it was, Sunday or Monday morning, I think it was a Sunday. So anyways, there's lots of people about on a Sunday morning. They saw something. It looked like an orange fireball with a blue gaseous smoke trail or a smoke cloud behind it was flying from east to west. And this, this fireball was described as anywhere between 4,000 feet and 25,000 feet up in the air. So the, it varied. But this object was obviously coming down. It was at a, going at an arch or an arc like this thing was gonna, this thing was gonna crash eventually, and this was at 10:30 in the morning. Well, Hill Air Force Base was actually doing a training mission with a B-26 bomber, which was piloted by a pilot named Robert S. Calwhite. And Calwhite was told to pursue this object once it came into view because they weren't sure what this thing was. So this B-26 bomber turns around and is chasing after this object. Meanwhile. Uh, the Salt Lake City Municipal Airport and the airport in Ogden, Utah, were tracking this object. They, th- they thought that it was a plane that was going down. And the, the tower over at the Salt Lake Airport said that they th- saw a square object. It was a black square that was on fire. And that's what they described, and this was coming down. And meanwhile, like I said, Cal White is chasing this thing. And... This object, they, they said that they could never fully catch up to this object. That no matter how fast this bomber was flying, that the object was always far ahead of them. But they did say they managed to fly into this blue smoke cloud. Well, when they would fly into this smoke cloud, they said the plane would start acting strange. Like it would start losing altitude or the engines would start sputtering or they would start revving almost as if they were intentionally trying to do that. Well... The Cal White was, they got to the smoke cloud, and meanwhile, this object, like I said, is way off in the distance, like going hundreds of, hundreds of miles an hour faster than this plane. And eventually, the object just stops. It's on fire, and it just completely stops. And this plane is flying, trying to catch up to it, and the plane almost runs into it. And right as the plane almost runs into it, this object goes straight down towards the ground, almost like it's going to plummet into the ground. And it shoots off into the distance. But it goes so fast that at the time, Cal White reported that they saw the object crash into the west side of the Salt Lake. But meanwhile, before the object took off, there was something that, they, that witnesses on the ground and Cal White and his crew reported as a flash of lightning. And this was in the middle of the daytime, of course, at 1030 in the morning. They saw what they thought was a flash of lightning. And there was no clouds around. And this object took off. Well, 
Cal White and the Salt Lake Airport, like I said, said that this thing crashed in the west bank of the Salt Lake. So ground crews were called out from Hill Air Force Base, and they started searching the lake, and they started searching the side, the west side of this lake. And the object actually didn't crash in the lake at all. What was strange, I'll have to fast rewind a little bit. Okay. Witnesses, saw, witnesses saw this flash of light, flash of lightning. Sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied here. They see a flash of lightning. And some witnesses on the ground say that they saw a second object coming from north to south and they say that they saw whatever this object was run into the orange object. Well, the object that came from north to south, witnesses say, was a green spherical object. And this green spherical object was reported earlier that morning in uh, Great Falls, Montana. And the, there was a military base up there. They were saying that they were following it, and it was doing a circular pattern, and it was on fire, and it was smoking. I don't know from what, but it was doing a circular pattern around Montana before it went south through Idaho. And there was an airline that reported seeing the flying object flying off in the distance faster than their plane was flying. So there's proof proof of the north-to-south object appearing before the east-to-west object. And after they saw this flash of lightning, it went as far south as Cedar City. People were reporting seeing this flash of lightning, by the way. Um, the, next thing, the next thing that is reported is that around 1130 on July 7th, 1952, an hour after the orange fireball made an appearance, there was a fresh forest fire about 30 miles west of Wendover, Nevada which is where this green spherical object ended up crashing. And Wendover, Nevada is kind of far from Ogden, if you look on a map. But this, whatever this object was, it crashed into the ground there. And there was a volunteer firefighter group that came from Wendover, West Wendover, Nevada, to go investigate this. And from what I was told, the firefighters pulled up onto the scene... And they said that when they were getting out of their truck, they were prepared for some kind of an airplane crash or that they were prepared for some kind of a chemical fire. So they said they were getting their hoses and all that ready, and they were heading out towards this smoking area. Well, as they were getting close to this smoky area, they said it smelled like a, like a chemical fire or that something was... Um, so they could tell that something wasn't right. And as they were walking closer and closer, the smell got more and more. They got stronger and stronger until they finally got to the point where they could see that there was a round, glowing, spherical object that had like a yellow smoke was coming out of this crater in the ground. And he said that this thing was glowing like a, like, I guess like you were frying bacon, like it was a pan, like this is the way worded, it was a pan that was frying bacon, this thing was hot, and it was smoking. He said it looked, it looked like it was wet. I don't know what he means by it. It said it looked like someone had hosed it off with a hose and that this thing was wet, but it was boiling at the same time, whatever this hmm. was. And I guess he says that eventually the military showed up and told him to leave. And he says at that point in time, they don't know what happened. They don't, that, that's the only, uh, the only stories I have from the southern crash site because I break it down to the southern crash site and the northern crash site. I like to... I like to talk about that one first because most the more interesting story is the orange object. So, okay. like I said, so they thought this orange object plummeted into the ground on the west side of the Salt Lake. And, but it, in reality, it, was, it collided with that green object and it took off going towards Nevada. And next thing you know was, I'd say, around 1040, 1045 in the morning... The next thing you know, there's a report by a man named, uh, let me look real quick, look at my notes. Uh, there's a guy named Hobbs. Uh, and Hobbs, he was working for the Southern Pacific Railroad, W.S. Hobbs. He was an assistant train master in a town called Montello, Nevada. And he says that they heard a heavy explosion around 1030 to 1040. And he saw, said that they saw a huge column of smoke and dust hanging in the sky. 
And they said that they saw a blue and yellow smoke coming out of an area known as the Derry Valley. Well, something interesting to note was that this was 112 miles west of Ogden, Utah. So this object collided with the green object and went 112 miles in about 5, 10 minutes and crashed in Nevada. So this thing was going at supersonic speeds faster than any vehicle or any kind of flying machine could have gone in those days. Um, anyway, so he says that they see the smoke cloud in the air for several minutes, and he says that it slowly drifted away. And the quick a note that I would like to make from the Ogden State Standard Examiner from July 8th is that Hobbs was interviewed, and he said that there was no, no blasting in the area at the time, so they don't know what caused this explosion. Well, on July 8th, which is the day after, a guy named Ralph Gibbs, who's a soil conservationist, him, he got a group of ranchers together from Montello to go investigate this area where the smoke was coming from. And he says the next day they found a 600-acre tract of burnt land in the Derry Valley, which at that time was 26 miles north of the town of Montello. Nowadays, Montello is kind of a ghost town. No one really lives there because a, a fire decimated a big portion of the town shortly after this, actually. But... Hmm. Um, they said that there was no evidence of a meteor. There was no evidence of a fire. I mean, there, obviously there was burnt land, but there was no smoldering. It looked like someone had put the fire out was the word I'm looking for. And they said around 1 p.m. while they were heading out to the crash site, they said that they saw a B-36 bomber uh, with a vapor trail flying from Ogden, Utah, coming towards Nevada. Because at this point in time, the newspapers were going crazy at the time, posting the story about a UFO, and I think that was what their version of trying to come up with some kind of a cover, like a cover-up, because they said that there was obviously a B-36 bomber, and they had a vapor trail coming out the back, and the military later said that that's what people thought they saw when they saw this UFO crash. So, kind, well, of, kind, of, a, kind of a dumb explanation, but that's what they said it was. So, you're... Um is this all your own thoughts, or have you read anyone else's ideas on this particular one? To uh, Has anyone else corroborated that they think there was a collision and that both of these vehicles or whatever they were uh, crashed oh, yeah. from the collision? Oh, yeah. Well, um, one quick note I was going to make is that most, most of the cases that I told you about besides the 1952 mine crash – there's really no other investigators besides me and Will, Willard McIntyre. But for this specific incident, there's um, all kinds of people that said that they saw the two objects hit each other. But there's also people that said that they didn't see the two objects hit each other at the same time. But there's more people that say that it hit than didn't. Mm. Um, I mean, I have different stories from different people around town. I could use their names and stuff if you need me to, but... Um, a lot of people ask me, well, how do you know that this wasn't a bull-eyed meteor, like the one that was seen in Russia somewhat recently? Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple different people that worked at colleges. Like there's a guy named Charles, Charles Osmond Weber. Or Charles Osmond, he worked at Weber College. He was an astronomy instructor. He said that the long trail of smoke and orange, I guess like the, the fire... He said those were characteristics of a meteorite, but he said meteorites enter the atmosphere at a speed of about seven miles per second, and they're usually entirely consumed before reaching the Earth. So he didn't think that he didn't think at the time that this was a UF, that this was a meteor. He thought that this was something else. Um, I guess, like I said, then there's the people in the Ogden Municipal Airport and the Salt Lake Airport. They said that they saw the object was a square square object. Right. And that's about um, the fourth or fifth UFO that I've heard described as a square object. Yeah. The one recently was uh, like an orange square object of, from an air flight um, in, in actually out, I think it is in Nevada or Utah out there. I don't know if you've heard about that case. Which one? It all started with a uh, ham radio uh the report that someone heard on uh, their radio, uh, uh, Jessica, I'm sorry, uh, Erica Lukes is investigating it. Oh, I'm not sure. 
Yeah, it's interesting. But it's one of the square ones you do hear about. So nothing uh, uh, surprised me when it comes to that. That did sound a little bit like a meteor um, or a fireball, which I've seen myself. I've seen a fireball. I don't recall if it had a streak behind it or not, but it was definitely like an orange. And uh, it was the most... I've had a UFO sighting, and this thing was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's this big orange ball just turning in the, as it was moving across the sky over me. Really a, a sight. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so had anyone looked into actually the sites where these things supposedly crashed? Um, yeah, there's a newspaper... Let me find it real quick. There's a newspaper story. It comes from the Ogden Standard Examiner on July 9th, 1952. They actually have pictures of the burnt area where this object crashed, and they describe where it was at and how many acres it is, and they describe uh, the people that were there, and um, they go into a lot of detail about it. The southern site, they don't have any pictures of it, but the and the July 8th, uh, 1952 edition of the, the Ogden Standard Examiner, there is there are uh, a couple of professors and witnesses that describe the green pea fireball and they describe what they saw when it flew by. Um, it says Charles Osmond and they say Dr. R.N. Thomas, they worked at the University of Utah at the time as professors. They says that the green, the green pea fireball would have had to have been awfully big, is what they said, for it to be a meteor. At the, I guess this is before the one that happened in Russia recently, of course. Right, the Chelyabinsk, uh, which uh, was really, uh, I, I think they found pieces of that in the lake, or at least I know they actually did find a lot of pieces of that, which when that exploded, that was really something else. Um, mm-hmm. Are there other cases as well that you've uh, looked into or anything more? Uh, let's see. There was a, the 1970s. Uh, we wanted to talk about that briefly, the mass UFO landing. Yeah. Oh, is that um, the one you've already? No, you haven't talked haven't about this one. I haven't covered that one yet. But it has to do with another copper mine, in which I think is kind of strange. You often hear about uh, things going on around copper mines. It's actually the same copper mine that the object supposedly crashed into in 1952. Okay. Um, I got this story again when I was featured in the Ely Times. People thought, I don't know if people thought I was looking for this story when I was talking about the other story, but I started getting a lot of miners that worked in those 1970s at the Robinson Copper Mine. Well, this event took place in the 1970s, the early 1970s, And um, I guess the best way to word this is this was, again, during the night shift. And the individual says that, well, individuals, they said that during the night shift, the lights lights were shutting off and on, off and on, like there was either a short in the lights or that there was their generators were going out. And he said that the lights flash on and on several times in a... Whoever was in charge of the mine at the time, I call him the foreman because I'm not really sure what title they would, what title that would be. They said the mine foreman told all the employees to leave, that they need to go home because the lights weren't working and they couldn't see what they were doing. So the majority of the miners left within a few minutes of that, and the lights were turning on and off meanwhile. And he says that the lights turned back on, and there were, I guess, a couple small groups of miners left. Well, the, the lights shut off again and turned back on, and they shut off again. And this time, the foreman, in a more stern voice, getting kind of angry, says, well, you guys need to all leave this mine. You need to get out of here. The lights, are, the lights aren't working, so you need to go home. So they thought this was kind of strange, that why would they want them out so bad? Like, why would they want them out within minutes? Like, get out, get out, get out type of thing. So I guess he said a couple more people left. And there was only a few stragglers left in this mine. And I guess there was another series of lights flashing on and off. And this time, the foreman approached who had the couple groups of people that were left. He started raising his voice and yelling, saying, you guys need to get out of here now. That uh, the lights weren't working and that they need to get out or they were going to be fired or that their jobs were going to be at stake. So... Um, I'll have to go to an individual person's story. 
to tell you what he saw, and then I'll tell you, go on from there. Sure. This individual person, he says that he was one of, I guess, the last couple people there. He was carpooling in a Jeep, Jeep Wrangler, he said. So they were driving down this dirt road heading towards the town of Ruth, and this road kind of wraps around the whole edge of the mine and goes through like a wooded area before it comes out in the city or the town. So he says they were between the wooded area and the mine, but they were, weren't in the actual mine itself. He said they pulled over to go use the bathroom before they went into town because they were going to go gambling or do whatever in Ely. Because I told you Ely's 12 miles from Ruth. So they were going to go get ready to go to the casino and go gamble. And he says while they were using the bathroom, they saw some kind of a glowing object come out of an area called the Duck, uh, the Duck Creek Wildlife Area which is not to be confused with the Duckwater Indian Reservation. The Duck Creek Wildlife Area is kind of like a national park that anyone could go visit there even nowadays. Well, the object came from that general area. It flew slowly over the copper mine where they were just at, and he said that it looked like it was having trouble staying in the air. And whatever this object was, was slowly landing, and it was spraying a, like a reddish-colored oil or like a thick su- liquid of some kind from the distance that they saw it, and it was going all over the ground. And um, this object landed in the mine, and again, the lights shut off, almost as if, as if this object was making the lights shut on and off. And I guess within a few minutes, the exact, word, the, the exact word I was given by several witnesses, within minutes, military helicopters came flying over the mountains like they were either tracking it, or this was a man-made UFO and I guess they landed in the copper mine, and I don't know what, what they were doing, but they landed in the copper mine, and the very next day, I was told, the helicopters were seen carrying this object off over, uh, over the south side of Ely, which means that literally, I, I guess, hundreds of people could have seen this thing flying over the city. I know a few dozen have contacted me, but there's probably more. And they, were, they had this thing on a tarp, and they were flying towards modern-day Area 51, which is towards the south. But hmm. what I think is interesting about this was, as far as I know, this is the earliest case that I know where the military might have had a man-made UFO that was documented and was being followed by these helicopters. I, I think the two scenarios that come up in my head is this thing was either a man-made UFO that was crashing or was starting to crash and they need to make an emergency landing and of course that was the only area in that that was safe to land or I think what was happening is it was a real UFO and it was crashing and going like I said it was flying slowly slow enough to where they could track it and that's when they sent these helicopters I don't know where the helicopters came from like I said Hill Air Force Base is the closest actual military base or it could have come from Area 51, because that did exist at this point in time. How far away is that military base? Uh, Ogden, Utah? Yeah, from that. It's 200 miles in a car. I don't know how long that would take flying. Yeah. Um, this sort of rings like the a little bit like the Cash Landrum case, which was uh, 1980, you know, later. later. Um, mm-hmm. But there are some similarities, and there are more people that are thinking that was actually a military uh, experiment gone wrong. I don't know if you've uh-huh. looked into that case at all or read about it. I've heard it. about it. Yeah. Um, and there were several hel- helicopters actually trailing this thing. I think, uh, I can't remember exactly how many, something like four. Maybe he said more. it looked, the that specific witness said it didn't look like the helicopters were in a really big hurry. They were just kind of casually flying in that area like they knew that it was going to land in that area or that they already knew that it was down there. It's a very... Um, you know, it's, it's, it could certainly happen where, you know, they are experimenting with something military that went wrong somehow, you know, and people weren't supposed mm-hmm. to see it. I can, I could see that happen. And how far away is that from Area 51? Um, Area 51 is about an hour and a half, uh, hour, hour and a half. Okay, by flying, not too far away. From flying, it wouldn't even take a few minutes. Right. So, but when the when the other incidents happened in the ni- early '60s and the '50s, Area 51 basically didn't have the capabilities to send out uh, vehicles or anything. That's something I found was thought was interesting, 
about the whole thing is they didn't really have helicopters. Well, they had early helicopters, but nothing capable of lifting the UFO or anything in the earlier cases. Mm -hmm. So uh, a little bit about yourself now. These things you've deep you've looked into deeply, and you. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you always, um, for all these cases, um, that you actually put your name in a newspaper with your phone number and email address for someone so someone can contact you. Is mm -hmm. that exactly what you do? Um, I don't start off doing that. I mean, I, I do it eventually, but it's usually not my first way of contacting people. Usually I'll be given a, like a witness will call me and I'll ask them, if they had anyone that was with them when it happened or if they know of any neighbors or anything. But if I, meet, if I get to a dead end, I will put my phone number and all that out there. And usually somebody will call me. Somebody I haven't talked to before will contact me that way. Right. And, you know, some of these are going back to 1952. It's almost as far back as Roswell. A lot of these people are gone at this mm -hmm. point. Um, did you get any, like, secondhand, like my father said this or my aunt said this? type of situations um yeah the best way to word it is i get a i get a lot of second and third hand witnesses but mm -hmm. i do get a couple of first hand witnesses and if the second hand witnesses stories closely match the first hand witness stories usually i'll i'll throw those in there and and investigate those further but this did happen so long ago of uh, most of these cases that you do have to look into the third hand stories and try to as best that you can try to piece it together and see if it matches the first hand witness. Yeah. Like the train story has, I'd say about a dozen people I've talked to that were actually there. And then I'd say there's probably about a dozen people who are second hand witnesses that I have. Like for instance, the guy who was a kid at the time, but his mom went out there. Oh, I see. Uh huh. And, uh, how, Earlier you were talking about you go all over the country. Mm -hmm. So um, is this is this more than a hobby to you? Um, I primarily look at it as a hobby. Like I'll, I like I guess the best way to word it is I'll get really heavy into the UFO thing for the Ely case for a couple months, and then I'll kind of lay back, and then I'll get heavy onto it again and lay back. Um, mm -hmm. In April we were over in Ely again. We actually, we actually found the crash site to that train story. But I think it's and, sep September, so we're supposed to come back. And can you describe when you say you actually found the crash site, how, how you uh, came about that conclusion? Um, yeah, well, we were, we were given a couple landmarks. We were told it was at the base of a mountain and that there were train tracks farmer's field and it would have had to have been someplace that was hard to get to because the train or the crane would have had to have lifted the ufo from wherever it was at and we were also told to look for a specific mile marker next to the tracks because at the time the tracks were labeled every one or two miles generally mm -hmm. um we found the we found the mile marker well not the mile marker it was destroyed with time but we found the one before and the one after so somewhere in the middle was where we started looking. And I know that there's a couple, there's room for error, of course, could happen a little bit before, a little bit after that. But we found that strip of copper colored dirt and that dirt would have had to have been brought from one of the properties that the mine owned. And the property that the mine owned was, I guess, across the valley, to word it best. And the mine would have never dumped their mining waste on non-mining property because they would have been would have been an environmental disaster. If the media got a hold of that, they would have sued them. Somebody would have sued them, especially if because those farmers' fields are right there, and you can't. And they probably wouldn't want you dumping mining waste in their fields. But it's that long strip along that certain. It's like a it's a long stri strip. It's on a portion of the tracks that's next to that crescent moon-shaped part of the tracks. It's on a bend. Um, they have the ditch with water. Um, the best well, the way to word the the two oldest ranches in the area are right next to that crescent moon shape, and they're next to that portion of the tracks. And the man that was living at Bassett Lake Ranch said that in the, at the time he was living on a ranch in that area, and so it would have been one of those two ranches he was saying. I see. So 
So we have a couple of different landmarks that matched up to that area. And the guy that was, the couple people, well, we talked to the brake man, and we talked to one of the engineers, and they actually gave us that mile marker. And so you said the mile markers are gone. What, did you pace it out or something? How did you come um, up? Well, there's, in the old days, they would have mile markers every, like I said, one or two miles, sometimes a little bit further, depending on the specific railroad. Um, when you go, when you drive next to the tracks along the freeway, or if you get out and walk the tracks, they're all destroyed, basically, most of them. You just see one every once in a while type of thing. We got extremely lucky that we found the one before and the one after what we were looking for. Hmm. Um, Sean Pitts, the museum administrator or the curator, he told us that he had worked for the museum for 20 years or 25 years, and he had never, ever even seen a picture of one in person. And when we came back saying we found two of them and the ones that we were looking for, <laughs> he looked like he'd seen a ghost. He looked all freaked out. It was kind of funny. Huh. Now, but, um, did you pace just, all – did you – did you walk the tracks? Is that what it was? And for, if we originally walked the tracks, and then once we started finding what we thought was a hot spot, we got a four by four, like a like a side by side quad that could fit four people in it. And mm -hmm. me, my brother, and our friend Nick drove out there on a quad, and uh, that's when we started discovering more of these landmarks. Wow! But so, it's almost like it's hidden in plain sight, though, because you would think that it happened further away from town than where it's at. Mm -hmm. All right. So obviously a lot of people know you out there because they contact you uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to these older investigations. Does, does anyone ever talk about anything newer or things that have happened since or anything like that? Um, they see a lot of UFOs in the area, but I don't know of any other crashes supposedly something I'm looking into I want to do on our next trip is we were told that there's another tracking station that was built in the 2000s on top of another mountain close to the Kimberly Mountain tracking station. I don't have much information on it, but I do want to look into that. Now, you're saying that you think there's actually some type of tie between crashes and the tracking stations? Yeah, I know of about four or five different UFO crashes where they built these tracking stations close by. I've heard of this before, um, like the one out in White Sands, the famous yeah. UFO crash in, that uh, looks like a white object that uh, cr crashes. It's quite a video, mm -hmm. and uh, that's supposed to be uh, near a, a tracking or radar. And there is speculation that it's, uh, you know, if, if there is any truth to these being extraterrestrial, I never like to say they are definitely, but... Uh, if there's any truth to how something could travel um, for so many uh, light years and get here and crash, you know, that's the thing, the argument always people say, how could that possibly happen? They'd have the advanced technology to get here, but then they'd crash once they're here. But, um, you know, it's possible and people have speculated that perhaps they're not prepared for uh, a radar uh, being shot at them and, you know, might affect their equipment yeah. or whatever it is. Who knows? Is that what you're thinking? Is that some of your thoughts? Um, I think I think it has more to do with the military. From what I was told from the people that worked at the Kimberly tracking station, they were, from what they told me, the military was thinking that maybe another object would crash in the same area or that other objects would come to try to either save the, save the crashed object that was already there or to try to, I don't know if you want to say, investigate what had happened and come back to that area? I see. I don't know if, I don't know if they planned on sending airplanes or something to try to shoot down the future objects or what, but um, at least with, I know with the Kingman, Arizona UFO crash and the 1952 Ely crash, they did build radar tracking stations within five years of the objects crashing Oh, you mean within five years after? Yeah, within five years after. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, something I forgot to cover, uh, I know you don't have too much longer in the show. Um, I was contacted by a witness who goes on nature walks outside of the town of Ruth, and she says that she came across an area where they had a mining waste was dumped, I guess, back in the, I guess back in the 70s. And she says that she 
looked on local maps and she was asking around, and there's no, no reason why there should be mining waste dumped, again, outside the mining area. And she says that inside all this soil, she saw what looked like a bunch of dark-colored rocks, but they looked like lava rocks. And she, she ended up giving me these rocks, and she says, or gave me one of the rocks, and she says that people that were there at the time when this object was supposedly spitting out this oil I was telling you about in the 70s, I guess they scooped up all this dirt into a pile and they dumped it somewhere. Well, I think she found the dump site where they dumped this oil and it hardened into a rock over time. And I have one of these rocks and I got it looked at by about 10 different people ranging from people that used to work at the smelter for the mine I looked at, uh, or people that were seniors, for senior geologists, I, some professors at UNLV, and they do different tests on the rock. They do scratch tests, they do different charts, they do color tests, uh, they chip little pieces off of it, but no one could tell me what it is. The only thing they could tell me is that it's a type of hematite rock. But I think that lady was onto something, like I said, because in my opinion, I think that she might have found the area where they dumped this soil, where this oil was spraying out. And maybe because it wasn't a classified vehicle, maybe it was just, I guess the, the way to word it, I worded that wrong. Maybe it was a man-made UFO, and because it was oil that wasn't anything top secret, maybe they just dumped it off to the side type of thing. Or maybe they didn't know that that liquid was in there when they dumped it. One of the uh, things, either, going back to the Cash Landrum case, there there was actually radiation burns in mm -hmm. that case. Uh, uh, I think an arm and uh, Colby, who we, we've had on the show, Colby Landrum, was in the car and basically ducked underneath the dashboard at the time. Um, but anyway, there was just a, within a few weeks after that happened, they dug up the road right where the thing, uh, it didn't touch down, but it came down kind of low, you know, when, yeah. when uh, there was radiation burns. So they dug up the entire road to get rid of it. And if that was a military craft, you'd almost think that if they expelled oil or anything, that they might do something with that. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever put that, just out of curiosity, have you ever had that tested by anyone of science, or was it just people's opinion? Um. I had it done. I, I I know it's very expensive to get it done in like a laboratory, but it's yeah. mostly mostly tests by people doing all kinds of tests that aren't putting it into some type of machine that gives you the elemental breakdown. Mm -hmm. I know um, I actually got an argument with Art Bell over it because he wanted me to give the rock to him. And then I told him, well, if it is something strange, I just went on the biggest radio show in the country of this sort and uh, just, and just uh, gave away my only uh, cool piece of evidence. And then he didn't like that. And then um, other than that, I uh, haven't really heard from anybody offering to get it tested or anything because I know uh, I think it's $5,000 or $3,000. And my friend Nick looked into it. Yeah, it's very people don't realize how expensive some of those those type of tests are. Um, and a lot of times people will entrust someone um, because they can get it done for free or, a, a, you know, that think they're doing something with science. And mm -hmm. they end up, uh, for instance, Ray Stanford had um, something from the Socorro incident scraped on a rock and brought it down to Goddard. And they tested it there. And sure enough, when he got the rock back, the all the sample was scraped off, gone. Oh, you know. geez. Yeah. Yes. So you wonder who to trust when it comes to that, that type of testing. If if you just brought it to a place and just didn't even say what it was and just said, um, you know, this is an unusual rock. Can you please test it? That type of thing. That's the only way to yeah. approach something like that, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we are coming up toward the end of the show. And uh, if there's uh, I don't see any questions up on the message board again. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about your uh, your blog site? Do you do an active blog there? Um, I go back and forth. I, I'll write a couple blog posts here and there for a few weeks, and I kind of won't go on there for a little while when I get busy with other things, and I'll go back on there. I go back and forth. Yeah. Um, most of the time I write on there if, it's, if I find something new and interesting out about the Ely case. But like I said, we, I do belong to a paranormal group where we do other things also. 
And if we get some cool evidence that I think is worth sharing, sometimes I'll put that on there. But um, I've been meaning to update my UFO crash website. I've been meaning to write on my blog again. I just haven't really gotten around to it. Well, you sound but like I do, you, we, you do a uh, lot of things. Oh, yeah. We do, uh, I do – we do creature cases. We do the UFO thing. We do ghost hunting. Um, I do uh, – we do update our Facebook, our YouTube and we have a regular website that we update all the time. It's just we kind of have lots of things to update. Okay, just one last thing I wanted to, because I think it could be kind of humorous. You got in an argument with Art Bell on the air? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was like a couple, like two or three years ago, I was asked to go on his Midnight in the Desert show, and I was talking about the Ely cases at the time. Of course, I didn't have as much information as I do now, but he wanted me to give him the precise location of the crash site. And then, like I said, it's in someone's farmer's field nowadays. I told him, I can't have, I can't have people walking around in this guy's farmer, this field. And he told me that no one would go out there and look in the field if I said where the location was. <laughs> if, you said said, it, if you said yeah, it on I the said, air, you're talking about? He said about? it on the air, he said that. And I said, <laughs> yeah, right. I know for a fact, they still go out to Roswell and to these other locations and there's nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he didn't like the fact that I was on a cell phone because I talked oh, to yeah. his producer. Yeah. His name was Pete or Paul or something like that. And he told me it was okay that I was using a cell phone at the time because I didn't have Skype. But because oh. I didn't have internet at that point in time. And Art Bell acted like it was a surprise that I was using a cell phone. So in the middle of me talking, he literally hung up on me and I haven't heard from him since. <laughs> oh, no. So oh, uh, if wow. you look me up, that's like the main interview that... that appears on that shows up on google and all that which it's kind of a shame it's kind of a tra tragic really but <laughs> have you gone funny. back i and, think it's funny have you gone back and actually listened to the interview yeah it starts sometimes it makes me mad and sometimes i think it's funny <laughs> <laughs> and uh what did you do go to open lines right after that uh i don't know because after he hung up on me i got so mad at the time i didn't uh i did i tried calling him back a couple times he wouldn't answer and I told him I would go down there in person because he lives close to here and he didn't want me to go in person either. So I don't know what, how he wanted me to fix the problem. Oh, oh well. Yeah, I yeah. think you're the only, like, the second person I think I've heard of this. Uh, yeah, well, uh, well, you survived and you made it through tonight and I didn't hang up on you. And <laughs> if you can, just uh, you, you said that you are involved in a couple of websites or is it just that one? Um, I have probably about four, I'd say three or four main websites I'm involved in. All right, just throw throw uh, the interesting ones that people, our listeners, may be interested in. Give us the best the best one to visit. And it has links to all of the other websites that I'm involved in. Is my paranormal groups website? It's called Bigfoot's Pad, B I G F O O T S P A D dot com, and that's my paranormal groups website and links. In the links section, you'll see my UFO crash website and my blog will be on there, too. All right. Well, we are just out of time, so thanks so much, and you take care. It was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Okay, everyone. So uh, that's it for our show this evening, and thank you. And I want to thank a few other people out there. Uh, Peggy Shunning for managing the Facebook page. Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for our music. Uh, Alejandro Rojas for doing the news. And we'll be seeing you here same time next week. Keep your eyes to the sky.